Gabriel Marcel and Secondary Reflection Moving beyond primary reflection to an intimate experience of being. It must first be declared that there is no real definable Marcellian methodology, and it seems apparent that this is the way Marcel wanted it to be. Speaking on this theme, Alfred Schmidt said, Something in the very nature of his approach to philosophy seemed to make the task impossible. He encountered a barrier constructed of his own refusal to turn a philosophical question into a technical problem. Marcel's philosophy is first and foremost steeped in experience. He is very weary of any type of dogmatism in his approach to revealing truths. Instead of a top-down approach consisting in the passing on of some static body of knowledge, he instead initiates the reader in a type of journey of discovery in which the truths themselves are revealed, not only to the reader, but also in a sense to the writer as well. Some have compared his style to a winding path. Marcel himself often uses the term concrete approaches to juxtapose his philosophical journey towards participation and being from a more formal relaying of simple abstract conceptualizations. In this sense, his approach, at least in his strict philosophical writing, is phenomenological, a term he was not opposed to as he felt it had at its core an unfettered journey to the essence of being. His favorite label for his approach, though, was Neoplatonic. He truly felt as though the existential metaphysical emphasis in his thought was a return to the true classic philosophy. His general style, which has at its core a real participation in the discovery of the dynamism of being, sheds light on the array of literary genres that he employs in his approach. The infinite dimensions of the object of philosophical contemplation can be reached in just as many ways but always within the dynamism of experience. Marcel felt that the treatise was not the only way these truths could be revealed in writing, and ultimately favored genres that are more experiential in nature to the reader. Marcel was a serious musician, and was a well-known music critic. His most utilized form of writing was that of the playwright. He wrote 30 plays in his lifetime, which won him many awards for their quality and depth. The plays always lead the reader deep into some question or conflict and continuously shed light on the greater ontological mysteries of life. He also published journals that have become some of the more important works for understanding his approach. The journal allows the reader to accompany him in his discovery of truths and see their development, as opposed to the polished final works that are so prevalent in many other philosophical works. He also wrote what could be called metaphysical phenomenological reflections that furthered his philosophical insights. Catherine Rose Hanley gives an incredible synopsis of the means Marcel used to engage the lector. The foundation of the body of Marcel's work is that he saw his life experience and communication as three concentric rings. The first was music, the deepest and innermost beyond words. The second drama, the concrete incarnation of conflict expressed in dialogue. The third and outermost ring, philosophy, brought reasoned analysis to the issues affecting the meaning of life. We see here a threefold movement in his existential phenomenological approach, in which experience leads to dialogue, which then leads to analysis. If any real, though somewhat vague, systematic analysis can be produced for Marcel, it is this description. Existentialists are known for their insistence on placing real emphasis on the place and time that philosophy takes place. Marcel opposes the idealist and rationalist belief that philosophy can be accomplished in abstraction. It takes place in the here and now. For Marcel, the current situation of man includes the encroachment of the methodologies of industry and science 
into realms that reach far beyond their scope. Experience, creation, relationships, and even man himself are becoming ever more defined by their functionality. Quote, The characteristic feature of our age seems to me to be what might be called the misplacement of the idea of function. The individual tends to appear both to himself and to others as an agglomeration of functions. Unquote. Gabriel Marcel. As man becomes mechanized and knowledge becomes increasingly naturalized, his sense of wonder is atrophied and he is sentenced to a life increasingly defined by determinism and despair. Quote, Generally speaking, modern man is in this condition. If ontological demands worry him at all, it is only dully as an obscure impulse. Unquote. Gabriel Marcel. Luckily, though, there seems to be something within man that counters the proliferation of a functionalistic attitude. Martel, Marcel perceives a need within man for communion with being. He says being is, or should be, necessary. Here in the relationship between man as function and his sense of despair is established. Man is in a sense created for metaphysics, for entering into the mystery of being. Philosophy, far from being an intellectual exercise, game, or puzzle, is a necessity of the human condition. Though the humdrum of our routines, schedules, and rituals seem to drown out that desire, it is still within us to varying degrees. He says, I aspire to participate in being, in this reality. And perhaps this aspiration is already a degree of participation, however rudimentary. Being continually reveals itself and the dichotomy between the need for communion with it and the lived reality of our significantly reduced participation in it becomes evident and we are faced with an existential uneasiness. He says, The philosophic attitude can reveal itself only as a certain way that the consciousness reacts to what must be called its fundamental situation. The reaction is a wonder, which tends to become a disquiet, consists above all in not taking reality for granted. We are called to more, but are seemingly stuck in the condition that faces us, in functionality and a naturalistic reduction, reductionism Man has, in a sense, lost himself, others, and a grip on reality itself. He is in agony and seeks a way out. Marcel says, Philosophy must bring to light the profound but usually unarticulated easiness man experiences in this technocratic, bureaucratic, bureaucratic milieu where what is deepest in him is not only ignored, but continually trampled underfoot. Man's disquiet has much to do with the confusion surrounding the very essence behind the interrogatory nature of the questioning being that he is, due to the aforementioned situation that he has been placed in. Modern man has been constantly given this mechanized, analytic, naturalized view of the questions that present themselves to him. Marcel wishes to provide insight into this by introducing the distinction between problem and mystery, one of his most celebrated achievements. By doing this, he will ultimately restore to us the proper object of philosophical study and lead us to our focus in this investigation of the necessity of secondary reflection. A problem is something outside of man and distant from him. It is meant to be solved, can be broken down into its constituent parts, analyzed, and scrutinized. It can be possessed by the one working on it, the ultimate fruit of which is verifiable and readily available to be passed on to another. A problem involves the world of techniques. It reveals itself in a sense of superiority of man over intelligible reality. 
It is the realm of Kantian and pragmatist epistemologies, whose systems impose upon reality instead of receiving it. A mystery, on the other hand, is defined by Marcel as a problem which encroaches upon its own data, invading them as it were, and thereby transcending itself as a simple problem. Mystery is philosophical knowledge, as opposed to the scientific knowledge proposed in problems. The scientific knowledge exhausts itself and reaches a point in which it can no longer continue. It points beyond itself to something more that cannot be reached via its own methodology. Marcel used the words metaproblematical and later on hypoproblematical to describe mystery. Problem and mystery need not necessarily be really opposed to each other as they are different types of knowledge altogether. It is just that in, resol in the resolving of the problem there is that residual uneasiness that points to the possibility that knowledge of the object is incomplete. The experience of the death of a loved one cannot be adequately explained by an autopsy, for example. The sense of incompleteness produced by the cold scientific facts creates the sense that there is more. Mystery, then, has its object of study those things that are not quantifiably verifiable. Hope, love, life, loss, being and existence are not the realm of science, mathematics, or even psychology. These mysteries are in need of another method that will help expose the essence of their being. Bringing us to the focal point of our study, secondary reflection. A study of primary and secondary reflection will look much like a study of problem and mystery the former being the means, and the latter being the object of study. Though much of the focus here will be in the differences between primary and secondary reflections, there is also some similarities that must be pointed out. The first and most obvious similarity is that they are both referred to as a type of reflection. For Marcel, reflection is nothing more than attention. It is the directedness of the whole subject to the matter at hand. Both types of reflection are not trivial. Marcel states that reflection is never exercised on things that are not worth the trouble of reflecting about. For Marcel, they, are also, they also both have experience as their origin, including the whole incarnate person. Here Marcel states that reflection is a personal act. It is linked as bone is linked with bone in the human body to a living personal experience. Given the broken world situation that we find ourselves in, there is not much need for Marcel of an in-depth analysis of primary reflection. It is the mode of reflection most utilized today to study the objects of the intellect. Primary reflection exists in the realm of the problematic or scientific it seeks to dismantle, disassemble, break down, and analyze the constituent parts. Its results are quantitative. Marcel speaks of a distance that primary reflection maintains from the object being studied, a sort of stoic detachment from it. The study is carried out in complete abstraction with the personal subject isolated from consideration. Primary reflection is not abhorrent in itself. It is useful in the realm of the problematic. Its force as a tool of destruction becomes evident when it begins to reach beyond its scope into the realm of the mysterious. The broken world encompasses both the increasing tendency to reduce our analysis of experience to only the problematic as well as the reduction of our tool set to only primary reflection. But this is in part accomplished by the tendency to look at mysteries through the lens of an attitude of only primary reflection. This atomistic, positivistic, scientistic, and problematic analysis leads to a sense of loss. When the mystery of community re is reduced to a naturalistic, animalistic, primal instinct of survival, community, on a deeper level, 
seems to be lost. When the mystery of the human person is treated by simply breaking him down into the various physical bodily systems, there's a sense of a loss of self. This dismantling of the object of reflection ultimately leads to dissatisfaction with the results of the analysis. In the experience, there seemed to be more, but the primary reflection was not able to reach it because it remained at the level of the problematic. There is an urge within man to go further, but he cannot with the tools of primary reflection. Marcel, in his work, The Mystery of Being, uses the imagery of embarking on a journey by foot and arriving at a large and passable river. The traveler apprehends the trail beyond, but cannot arrive there via the means he had be previously been traveling. Luckily, there is a ferryman on the shore that is able to take him across to the other side. The ferryman, in this imagery, is secondary reflection. With primary reflection, there was an unsatisfying dismantling, but that dissatisfaction pointed beyond itself to something about the experience that has not yet been identified. Embedded in the experience was the apprehension of something more. There is a feeling of a deeper meaning that has not yet been developed and is at the source of the uneasiness that is being experienced. Returning to the apprehension of being is the beginning of, science, of sec secondary reflection. This return, though, is a decision. It involves the will. It requires a stand that is taken on behalf of the personal subject. In this stand, he chooses not to take given reality for granted. He rejects the broken world, reductionism, of the purely problematic, and embarks upon a completely new intellectual endeavor. Collins describes it as thus. As the tool of metaphysics, recollection is a kind of reflection, a reflective act raised to the second power. It builds upon the original reflection, or intuition of being, which is available to every individual existent. In this instance, the realistic source of metaphysical speculation is the original awareness of being. The acquiring of this primary apprehension is the responsibility of each individual man in his personal relationship to existence. But it is a blindfold intuition, a non-self-conscious apprehension of existence in the existent thing. Marcel harkens back to the Augustinian vocabulary and likens secondary reflection to recollection. He states, This secondary reflection is recollection in the measure in which recollection can be self-conscious. Reflection, being attention, as was mentioned earlier, is an attention whose movement is inward. Marcel states, Recollection is doubtless what is least spectacular in the soul. It does not consist in looking at something. It is an inward hold, an inward reflection. It does not reach out to the experimental process or quantifiable data to investigate the initial apprehension of being. The subject must leave behind those former scientific instruments of investigation outside of himself and go inward. This is not to be perceived as a re rejection of the objectivity of the sense-perceptible world or of the senses themselves, though. This is not methodical doubt or some flight to the disembodied cogito. Marcel is emphatic about the necessity of considering the human person as an inseparable, composite unit of body and soul. Man must embrace his situation as being both body and soul, and use it as his starting point. The senses are the reliable means through which we experience and by which we also receive the apprehension of being. This recognition of an experience of the initial apprehension and the cognitive return to it is not the same in everyone and every experience. It is not purely passive. There is an element of participation on the part of the subject. This perception is like an ability or a talent that must be developed. Marcel, an accomplished musician and musical critic, 
often describe this ability as having an ear for being. The more man takes a stand against the reign of primary reflection and recollects himself, the more aware he will become of the mysteries embedded in experience. In this process of recollection, man returns to himself as a questioning being and seeks to unveil the dynamism of the object of contemplation. He seeks to know it on its deepest level. In this process, there is a type of conversion that happens. There is a sense of humility before the object of cognition. What he thought to be the case is in fact not the case. What he believed to have completely possessed is no longer within his grasp. There is more to this thing than was originally thought. There is a stark contrast here with primary reflection in which there was superiority, possession, detachment, and precision. As attention is paid to the meaning of the experience, the intellect begins to postulate descriptions and seeks to make sense of what is behind the given. The expression cannot completely encompass the meaning behind the experience, but can only grope towards a greater understanding of it. The increasing awareness of this embedded meaning can express itself in many ways that help crystallize the experience. As was mentioned earlier, Marcel himself used music, art, plays, journals, and phenomenological descriptions to outwardly express the increasing insight he is experiencing of being. This awareness and the subsequent crystallization or representation reveals a restorative dimension of secondary reflection. What primary reflection dismantled, secondary experience puts back together. The experience is no longer the sum of its constituent parts, but a meaningful existential instance whose depths the subject is invited to explore and make his own. As opposed to primary reflection, this increasing realization of the mystery of being is in no way to be considered as a possession, as in primary reflection. This awareness and restoration of the object of cognition is by no means merely an, an intellectual gain. This philosophical knowledge of being becomes a part of the subject in a mysterious way. As he grows in knowledge of the object, he himself is transformed by it. Being realizes itself within the subject. Here, we reach the objective of secondary reflection and the pinnacle of the philosophical quest. Here, the study of metaphysics is restored and given pride of place. For Marcel, this real concrete participation in philosophy and the study of being is only possible via secondary reflection. Not only is the object of intellection restored, but the philosopher himself is recovered. Not unlike the Aristotelian to mystic epistemology, man has the potential to become all things through this existential recollection. Conversion and transformation of the very philosopher is non-negotiable for Marcel. He says, I would not hesitate to say that philosophy has no weight and no interest whatever unless it sounds an echo in our life, a life which today is so threatened at every level. As a summary, we will treat the experience of primary and secondary reflection as a profane problem, an attempt to break it down into its constituent parts. The movements of these types of reflection will be traced crudely to better explain their unique movements and objects. 1. Experience. This is the source of both types of reflections. 2. Embedded in the experience are movements within the soul of the subject that have not quite yet been understood. This can be called the apprehension of being. 3. Attention is given in the form of primary reflection, dissecting and dismantling it 
in a scientific form, owning it in a sense. Four, after the initial scientific analysis, there is a residual uneasiness based in the aforementioned apprehension of being. There is an increasing awareness of the insufficiency of the primary investigation. Five, the subject must recollect the experience, secondary reflection, seeking to make sense of the awareness of mystery. He contemplates the experience, seeking its underlying substrata and significance. 6. A phenomenological representation of the reflection may be produced to help present the fruit of the reflection. 7. Insight is gained into the being of the object of cognition and becomes a part of the subject's own being. Secondary reflection is the tool of true metaphysics. It has as its goal an increasing insight into the essence of being, which in turn becomes part of the very being of the personal subject. Its fruit is more transformative than systematic. Marcel believed that the primary goal of philosophy was this transformation of the individual, and not the construction of some abstract body of knowledge. He saw the broken world and proposed mystery as the possible antidote, with secondary reflection as the means to entering into it.